Nobody's machined anything today. So I had a question. Okay. We're not, you know, I, I mean, look. Look at this mess. This is supposed to be people who finish every day working at the end of the day and they're supposed to be perfectly clean, huh, Pat? Oh my God, look at that. Look at all these chips on the bed. We don't want to be hunched over too far. See, right here, I'm pretty comfortable. I can work in this position for hours, you know, throughout the day. What I did was I ordered new uh, idler pulleys and you can see how they have a little ball bearing. And these are 626 ball bearings. You can see they're, they're about the same size. You know, they don't have to be perfect. Remember, they're just idler pulleys. Right, and that's why we haven't put the, uh, the levers on. on right. This is how it will look. Next to it is, is how it will look when it's done. Hey, welcome back. This is Shop Adventures 18. I'm Lance, that's Patrick back behind the camera, and we're wrapping up the year 2018. Okay, this week's topics we'd like to cover is we discuss our shop etiquette. We've had a little bit of picking on us. No, it's funny. We've had people just mention to us how neat and tidy, clean and everything is, like we literally don't do anything, but we do. So we're gonna give you a little of that. We're gonna share that. Uh, Patrick really lays down the line. He lays out that 11 on those two tables like there's no tomorrow and he's gonna tell you exactly why. And I even learned a thing or two myself again. Talk about reinventing. Um, we also, uh, Patrick does do an update. He has an update on the micro drill press, that little green German goodie. Um, he does something really neat with it. Um, we've captured it on film in real time. So I thought that was pretty exciting. A little, put a little pressure on him the end of the year thing. <laughs> okay. I continue to share updates on the Levin accessories and introduce you to a very rare accessory, not made by Levin for once, something new for us to share. Okay. We do have some updates on some machining and stuff that we're going to be doing and leading into it rather for the German tapping machine. And that's kind of neat. And I think that's all I'm going to have for this week, except I'm going to have Patrick come around over here to, with me to the camera. And uh, seems like we just did this a week ago. Yeah. To everybody <laughs> out there, so we just want to say a few things. Uh, uh, first of all, we're, we're thankful uh, that we, we, we're being accepted in the YouTube uh, makers, producers community, as well as YouTube viewers community. Um, it's been a lot to us. Um, I'm just sorry for one thing, Patrick. We, we didn't start earlier. Right. But it's better late than never. Um, um, we really we really didn't realize uh, how much we would get from this, what, what it would do for us. Um, not only does it make us keep our shop a lot cleaner than we had it. <laughs> sure. A little bit of pressure there. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, we just want to thank you for all that. And we want to reassure you that coming in the new year, we have already committed to ourselves to make a guaranteed 52 new videos for the year. Right. We've also guaranteed to do a section called pullouts, and that's where we get into very educational, not, but right now we're under science and technology, we're gonna have educational section. Very elaborate, detailed uh, uh, assemblies and stuff like that. But the regular, the regular uh, Shop Adventures series will still capture pieces and bits of that, so you'll still be entertained with that, but, the, but somebody who actually wants to know the minute, finute details of doing anything, Patrick's going to be doing these great videos. They'll be at great length and extreme detail with huge interaction. We're always available to help you. So I just want to do that. And I guess and on that note, Patrick, and our, and our thanks to everyone for the year 2018. And we're so excited because we're going to be cutting chips in 2019. And it won't be very much longer now. And we'll be building a product. What could that little micro mini product be? <laughs> from all of us, from the both of us to all of you, we wish you all a very happy new, new year. year. Okay, Lance is taking us out into the machine shop to share some lessons with us. Hey, hi. Okay, yeah, a little bit of lessons. Don't worry, we're not going uh, Mr. Pete here. <laughs> no teaching <laughs> going on. Just a little sharing about what you see sometimes in these videos and what, what maybe may not make a lot of sense, and, and, and I respect that. Um, I do come from uh, aerospace mainframe manufacturing uh, machining. So, you know, you, you won't find a place like that as neat and tidy as you're gonna find this place here. You'll notice that I'm sitting at my desk today, 
and it looks like the desk is taller, and it, it is, but it, it's actually more dramatic than you think, because this is how I used to sit, and you'll notice my desk has climbed. <laughs> We've learned a lesson or two around here. This desk has been reconfigured. It's all, like all of our tables here, they're completely perfectly balanced, and they're always monitored for their balance, and there's a reason for that too. If the little itty bitty micro mini parts roll just as well as big ones do, except when they bounce, they bounce out of the stratosphere. I, I have to say with about 95% loss rate when we drop something on the floor. Yeah, we've lost so many parts. I don't know where they go, but someday somebody's gonna find a whole box of them somewhere <laughs> <laughs> from all the years. So, so the tables get adjusted. Here's what's going on. Um, in this micro world, and well, let's face it, Patrick, we're, we're a little older than we were when we started 25 years ago or so. A little. So. so so we're, you know, if, if we don't set the table height right and I don't set the chair right, we don't put the tools and machinery just right, just over here. If we, it's fine for a day, it's probably fine for a week. You start messing around after that though, and next thing you know, your neck don't work. You know, it, your, your arm's a little sore. You know how that works as we get a little older, wrists don't work quite the same and all that. So we've learned to make the environment, and look, we're no different than you are. We put the table in, we're done. I don't want to readjust it, take everything off of it, resettle it. But but you know what? Um, yeah, I have to. We have to. You have to. I mean, those, those we're not young anymore. <laughs> so that's what I want to share there. Um, what I also want to share is that we get a lot of comments about our cleanliness. Um, that, gee, those tools look brand new, or gee, that looks really, really clean. And I really love it. Those like those are like supersonic comments to people like us. They're a big deal, right, Patrick? We really. Uh, oh yeah, we accept it as a compliment. We really do. It doesn't happen by accident. Um, in all of those hours that we work, because we do this full time, this is all we do every day, is that we spend a lot of time at the end of each day cleaning everything to its utmost best so that it's presentable for starting again the next day. Um, and everything's got its place and everything's refilled or it's necessary. So you're not running around, we're very efficient that way. You'll also notice that we wear these uniforms. And, and I gotta, I'm gonna stand, can I stand up for that? Man, yeah, sure. I'm gonna share. This, this is, I'm wearing a, a blue watchmaker's coat. Uh, Patrick, you'll always see wears a white watchmaker's coat. Oh, here I can. <laughs> see that? Am I in the... Yeah, I, I, you're in there. There you are. <laughs> okay. Hey. It's like this, we, we don't get visitors here. We've never had visitors really, but we do get clients. And the clients do come to inspect our operation before they give us micro machine work and particularly watch parts, timing device and instrument gauge parts, okay? That being said, they're not gonna come into a shop that's dirty in this environment. They're also expecting uh, our, our, our ethics and they're expecting us to have the proper attire. Now, let me just share a little bit about watchmaker world attire. And, and date back in time. It's just, I just want to share this today because I think it's kind of fun. Okay, so I'm wearing, we're wearing these coats as you've seen. I'm wearing a blue one. Here's the deal. In the machine shop, we are to wear a blue one. In the workshop, the cleaner environment, we wear a white one. Um, I don't know what we're gonna do when we do the finishing shop and finish installing everything there to move that stuff in there. I guess we'll have to have a, maybe we'll have like a- A I don't red know, one. A gray one or- A, a gray. Maybe. So you'll know which area we're working in. But if today's current watchmaker, for example, does wear a collar, he has to wear a collar shirt under this, under this, this is his uniform. Under that uniform is a collar shirt, typically a tie. He's typically going to have short sleeves generally, can be long, but they're short. Um, he's also gonna have full, full grown up big boy pants on. And that's the, that's, that's still very seriously taken and still very honored in the in the watchmaking world. And if you go back in time to the to the war efforts in America and the 1940s, you'll see those government videos of machine shops and how to use a micrometer and how to uh, set a cutter and how to operate this machine or that piece of equipment. And you'll notice people wore a full collar shirt, short sleeves though, because they didn't want to wind up in cutters, full dress slack style pants, and generally speaking, a tie tucked into the shirt so the tie wouldn't get dragged into the machine. It's, it, but at the same time, no safety goggles then. <laughs> it hadn't been figured out yet. So 
once upon a time, the machining industry had those, those ethics. The watch industry still very much has those ethics. And somewhere between those two environments sits this place called Active Adam, the home of Patrick and Lance. Patrick and, Lance. and so we do honor the uniform as far as the uh, coat, the, the work coats go. That white's really important in the, in the environment when the visitors come, but it's just important every day to stay in that, that mindset. Am I covering all this right? I think so. And um, maybe expand why our workshop, you know, has the wood floors, the cabinets. Oh, yeah. and... You'll see the difference. In our machine shop, you notice there's a few work tops that are, that are wood, and that's fine. And you'll see some, a lot of metal tool chests. That's fine. That's a typical machine shop look. I mean, you might have a laminate or not. doesn't really matter to me. You get into that workshop environment, you're going to notice something. We have metal metal pull-out drawers with wood tabletops. We have all wood tops on every table. We have wood work chests. We have work, wood, wood, wood cabinetry. We have wood flooring. And what we're doing there is that, that that's taking after the Swiss, I believe, and the German watchmaking industry. That ethic is very critical that that look is maintained in the world, the, it just always has been in the watch industry, and it is to this very day. Any, any search on a search engine of watchmaker, uh, I guess you'd call it what, watchmaker? Yeah, I think if you do a search like German or Swiss uh, watchmaking workshop, yeah, yeah. you'll get good examples of yeah, what see, we're talking Pat, about. See, so Patrick says type that in, basically, and you'll see, you'll see kind of what resembles our workshop. And, and and maybe even more exotic uh, than that. They can, they can get really elaborate. Yeah, you'll see beautiful workshops that you'll just drool. Yeah, I mean you're over. You're talking about you know fifty thousand dollar tables. They're yes. just fantastically hydraulic controlled, perfect balanced. It's an incredible environment. It's something everyone should really experience. But there's a reason for all of that. Again, it's about not losing little parts. It's also yeah. about how small those parts are and how a piece of lint can affect two parts together. Uh, a year, what have you, in the movement. And so I just want to share that. And, and I can't, and, and, and I mean, I don't want to be like we're like a hoity toities over here, old Mr. Uptight. I said that, you know, <laughs> we're we're not watch snobs in any way, the shape or form. We're the guys behind the scenes. We're the mechanic for your car when it comes to watches. That's really what we are. Uh, we do we do collect some really neat watches, though, huh, Patrick? Oh, yeah. We've got some pretty nice watches over the years that, We've acquired from other customers that didn't want them any longer. We found on our own or we've refurbished ourselves. Yeah, one day we may share that. Yeah, down the road, yeah. uh, we'll get into that it's a personal side of our lives that we like to share. Uh, I'm gonna confess to something a little bit. Um, I'm gonna take you for a little walk with me. You know, I always, oh, it's always so clean in there. All the little tools are so perfect. I wanna show you. Nobody's machined anything today. So I had a question, okay? We're not, you know, I, I mean, look, look at this mess. This is supposed to be people who finish every day working at the end of the day and they're supposed to be perfectly clean, huh, Patrick? Oh my God, look at that. Look at all these chips on the bed. Who used this lathe last? Look at that. You know, this, this person should really get <laughs> in trouble. My halo all right? <laughs> okay, we were just having a little fun with you. It is true though, I did not clean it. It's been here for a couple of days. I will get on it immediately. Okay, well, we're out here in the shop to see Patrick. We're gonna get a little update on the professional and correct way we'd like to mount our 11 lathe beds. Hi, Patrick. Hi. Okay, yeah, um, I just wanted to update you. You know, we finally, uh, confirm the placement of the chip tray and the motor base as I was explaining in last week's video and now that we've confirmed everything uh, the next stage is basically marking the table and drilling which we hope to get that started this coming week okay but I you know in the meantime now that we've had the, we have this set up and before we tear it down I just want to share with you guys just a couple of items uh, and I just want to share with you why we chose the placement like we did because uh, it's really important to us you know we, we there were a couple of things we didn't like about the Levin placement and let me just get started um, okay last week on the chip tray I shared with you that you know in terms of you know left or right 
um, I explained to you that we, tr we try, we want to be central to the light bed because, you know, we want to be really close to the, uh, to the headstock, but then we also have leaven accessories with levers. So we want to have good overall access to the lathe itself. So right here is a good placement and we kind of explained that in last week's video. Okay, the, the other item that we weren't confirmed on was the placement of the chip tray to the edge of the table right here. Okay, uh, Levin typically places the chip tray really close to the edge, about an inch to an inch and a half. And the problem we had with that was, you can just tell, it doesn't give you any room to utilize the surface. So, so we had a bad habit of throwing our tools, you know, placing our tools in the chip tray. And that's a really bad habit because when you're working, you got your chips falling. Sometimes you got, you know, cutting oil, tapping oil. And now we're putting our tools in here. We're scratching up the chip tray here with our tools. And it was just a really bad habit. So now that we're doing, redoing this with new tables, we decided to open up the surface area. So now we can finally utilize this little table area, you know, for our tools and maybe even a little parts tray right here. So as we're making the little parts, we can have a place to put them. Okay. Um, you may ask, okay, why three inches? You know, why not four, five, six inches? You know, give you more surface area. Well, the problem is if you notice, I'm wearing a loop on my glasses and we wear these all day, most of the day. Um, so, and the reason being, especially when working on the machine, you know, these parts are really tiny. So, you know, we're, we're taking a really good close, you know, at the part, you know, with, you know, uh, you know, moving the levers. And due to that, we don't want to be hunched over too far. See, right here, I'm pretty comfortable. I can work in this position for hours, you know, throughout the day. But just imagine if this bed was, you know, just a few more inches uh, away from me. You know, after a while, you know, it put a lot of strain on my neck and on my back. You know, just like Lance was talking about in his video, his, his recent scene right now that you guys saw, uh, we're taking a closer look as we're getting older on the um, ergonomics of, of how we work. Because, uh, you know, everybody can relate to being in a bad position in front of their computer. And, you know, after a few hours, you know, it just becomes really difficult and unenjoyable to work in that position. So that's why we chose that, and we hope that's going to be really effective, comfortable, and while giving us a little work area. Okay, so so the next item I want to talk about, which I touched on last week a little bit, was the uh, pulleys. Okay, um, in positioning the motor base, the concern is we can actually place this too close or too far away isn't much of a concern. When you're running your belt, you obviously don't want this way out here because you don't want, you know, if, why have the belt super long? You might as well come up as close as you can. So, and this is a good, you know, we also got a, um, I think last week I hit on it too about the idler pulley. You know, you gotta take that in consideration too because, uh, you know, the idler pulley has to end up pretty much right over the bed okay but in terms of placement left or right just like the chip tray we've got to be sure that the the belt is perpendicular or 90 degrees you know to the motor shaft for both the headstock and the motor so you know so 90 degrees you know here and there in two spots okay the problem arises where uh, let me give you a good scenario. If you are using a single step pulley for your motor, it would be pretty easy to align it because all you'd have to do is, you know, just install this on the motor, you know, do your alignment, and then you're set. Okay. Oops, let me put that back. Okay, but in our case, we use a multi step pulley. Okay. And the reason why we do this, I'll just be really brief is you, the middle one's used for most of the time for your general common work. Uh, but for the, for things like um, when we're using our micro drill accessory where, where we're using little micro drills, we, you know, we want a really fast speed. 
but we also don't care about torque. You know, we don't need the torque when we're using little micro drills. So that's where we would use the large pulley because that'll give us the maximum speed, sacrificing the torque, but we don't care. Okay, the little pulley would be where we're turning an unusually large part for the slave, where we don't care about the speed, but we do want the torque. So that's why we choose to use this multi-step pulley rather than the single step pulley, okay? Okay, one of the things to consider when mounting this though, is if you look, you know, you can't have this, you can't utilize all three steps and having this permanently mounted on the motor shaft because, you know, if we align the belt to use the middle pulley, what if we decide to use the large pulley? Now our belt's going to be crooked. So one of the things we have to look at is what I did was with this, with the pulley mounted flush to the shaft, I, I aligned the belt perfectly to the middle step, okay? Now if we want to use the small step, all we do is just loosen the pulley. You got a good... I got you good here. Okay. See, if we want, so we want to go from the, so here we'd be using the middle uh, step. Okay, if we want to use a small step, all we do is loosen the pulley, move it down the shaft, and now we're set for the small pulley. Okay, now if we want to use the large step, all we do is remove this, turn it around, put it back on the, on the motor shaft, and now we're set for using the large pulley. See, in all three cases, you'll notice that the belt is, is perfectly 90 degrees in all cases to the headstock and to the motor. Well that's good because we have to work with our ear like literally right next to that belt 10 hours a day. Yes. And that makes it brings up some question I might have. I think I know why, clearly why the motor is mounted on top of the table instead of under the table like Levin recommends, huh? That's right. You know that's actually where this single step pulley is really common. Uh, this is actually made by Levin and it's an option to use but People use this when they put the motor on the bottom because, you know, you aren't going to be going under the table, moving your pulley. You're going to just have one, one step and just utilize it. But in our case, because we use the different leaven accessories, you know, we do want the option of using any of the three steps or, you know, for the different purposes. So, yeah, you're right. That's, that's a good, good analogy. Okay, so now that we've got Patrick trapped out here under the spotlight of the camera, it's probably time to pan left a little bit if we may. There seems to be a blatantly large, for, for this operation, <laughs> that is a large missing object on the wall I believe used to be the uh, picture from Don Bailey at Suburban Tool. Right, you know, just last week we were talking about this lovely photo of a watch movement, now it's gone, and I'll tell you why it's gone. Um, we had, uh, when we launched our or published our last video, we had a comment by the uh, user named Mitch Wright. And one of the questions he asked was, you know, what's the significance of the watch movement and Don? I think he had made a comment uh, asking if, you know, did Don make the movement? And I kind of replied, I said, no, you know, uh, from what I could remember, I responded to him and said, Don told me in, at a young age, he was into photography. So he was taking photos, you know, you're new to photography, so you're taking photos of everything you like. And Don just happened to have this watch movement, and he liked it, so he decided to take some photos of it, and he made a blow-up, and that's the blow-up he had in his office. And he had it, obviously, for so many years, because it was so faded. And But the, the thing was, I couldn't remember, um, at the time, writing that comment to uh, Mitch, uh, where Don got the movement and I had told Mitch you know that I had the letter that Don wrote me behind the frame so I could easily just go behind there and and see where you know and read reread what Don wrote me and get the details of everything which Don you know gave me the details but what happened is so I'm getting you know putting my arm under there trying to find the letter I couldn't find it so I took the I took the frame off it was gone, and then I finally remembered when we moved here, we removed the letter and other items so we wouldn't lose it. Problem is, we lost it, and then I had to refind it. <laughs> so the question, so 
Uh, fortunately, I did find the letter, and I did find a couple of other items along with it that I had. And one of the things Don sent me is, he sent me a couple of these photos. Let's see here, let me just get a little bit better. Yeah, there you are next to that, look at that. And these are, I should add, uh, these are recent photos. Just to show he still has this watch movement, which is amazing. And why he included these photos was he wanted, he wanted to kind of give me uh, an idea how big this movement was. And as you can see, this is a dime. And it's really about the size. Obviously, oh, yeah, this the dime's dated 2011, so it is a fresh picture. Right, or 2012, is I it 2012? think. 2012? Yeah, it's hard to see. Could be either. But as you can see, it's the size of a dime, so it's obviously a ladies' movement. And so, but that's right, because even I thought, you know, from looking at this big blow up, this is where it's at right now. You'd think it's a really large movement, but um, so this was really interesting. This really gave you a good perspective of the actual size of the movement. So, so that what is one giant blow up. Yeah. <laughs> so, what we're going to do is, you know, I'm going to be so we don't lose any of this. I'm going to get all the information, put it in an envelope, put it behind the picture, and then put the picture back up. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, sure. thank you. Okay, thank Patrick. You. Okay. Patrick's supposed to have some updates on the progress on the little uh, German green uh, micro drill press. Let's check in with him and see how we're coming along. Hey, hi, Patrick. Hi. Yes, we have an update. Yeah, if you're a regular viewer of ours, you have seen our German drill press quite often, you know, as we make progress on it. And where we left you on it last time was... Uh, we actually have a few issues with it. Or not really issues, uh, kind of problems... Well, yeah, kind of issues that we have to resolve until we can put in production. And briefly, I'll explain really quick. Um, the first item is the draw bar. Uh, you know, we've mentioned the draw bar. You know, we got the drill press in perfect running condition, but the draw bar is pretty beat up and old. So we're actually going to machine one of these ourselves. Um, actually, we can do the machining 100%. We, you know, we can do the deep drilling, machining it. The only thing we can do is that when, uh, before we can put this to use, the outside has to be ground perfectly cylindrical. Um, there's not a tolerance to the diameter. The tolerance is, you know, has to be perfectly cylindrical from one end to the other. So that way, you know, this holds a eight millimeter WW watchmaker collet. So in order to work, you know, precisely, you know, it has to be perfect. But the problem is, is we don't own a cylindrical uh, grinder. I mean, we can do, a grinding to a certain extent on a small scale on the 11 lathe, but we believe this is too large to do it with our equipment. So, okay, YouTubers, fellow YouTubers and viewers, <laughs> step up to the plate here. I don't have it ready to send today, but I could sure use someone that would be willing to just grind that for us. Like he said, it's not a tolerance issue, it's a, consi it's a consistency issue, right? Yeah, Over the distance of the exactly. Length. The, the tolerance isn't on the diameter. It's really, it's the, it's the tolerance from one end to the other. We want, it has to be consistent, you know, perfectly cylindrical. Yep, so if you, you can know. handle that for us or have an idea on how we can get that done, we just need one done. We don't have it ready yet when we do. And we'll pay for it. Yeah, we're willing to pay, no yeah. problem at all. We just need a little help, and that's just something we just can't do today, but we hope to in the future. Yeah, okay, so, then, okay, so we got that. You know, we still need to machine a couple of little oil caps. You know, right now we have these little silicone things Lance made. And they're, they're fine for right now, so they don't let dirt in. You know, we've got to oil these. This, this oils the bronze bearings right here. So we got to oil that prior to use, you know, every time. Okay, and then the last thing, this, this was the most significant issue to us. Uh, one of the problems, when we first powered this up for you guys, um, and I'll put up a little clip of the problem to refresh some people, you know, if you don't remember, and especially the new users that haven't seen this before. And then down below Pat's, man, down below Pat's foot is a uh, foot pedal for this. How this works is this is an idler pulley. So how this works is, so you've got the pulley that goes around, I mean, you got the belt that goes around the motor pulley here, come, so it goes on one side of this idler pulley around the drill press spindle, 
back to the other side of the eyelid pulley and then back down to the molar pulley. Okay, the problem we had, had though is when we fired this up, we we're getting really bad chatter. I mean, it sounded really bad. And initially when I was on video and we fired this up, you know, I just thought, okay, you know, we just have a problem where, you know, these collars are too loose. We just have to tighten them up and that should resolve the problem. But that didn't fix it. So I even, you know, tried, this is the original um, shaft. You know, we even purchased a new shaft with a little larger in diameter. We couldn't go too large because then we'd have to, you know, bore the whole of the bracket. We don't want to do that. So we went lar as large as possible and that still didn't resolve. It's still making a lot of chatter. So we figured, okay, the only solution is, you know, we really hate to do this. You know, when we buy old machinery, we always try to uh, keep it original. You know, we try, we don't want to modify parts. We don't want to replace parts. We really want to utilize it in its in original state. But you know, sometimes we just can't help it. You know, when we restore these machines, we're going to put them in production. So, you know, they got to be able, they got to be capable of running, you know, eight hours a day or even longer, you know, every day. So uh, what, I, what we decided to do was, just um, for do these uh, either pulleys. See, the problem is, is uh, these are uh, these have no bearings at all. Uh, they're they're made out of brass. They are brass. Things. Yeah, they're brass, and they're just they're riding straight on the shaft. So what what I did was I ordered new uh, idler pulleys, and you can see how they have a little ball bearing, and these are six two six ball bearings. You can see they're, they're about the same size. You know, they don't have to be perfect. Remember, they're just idler pulleys. So the size isn't really, uh, doesn't matter in this application. So, and, you know, so they're pretty good. Um, they're, this, these are as close as I could find, but it should be more than adequate. So what I'm going to do now is, I think Blance is going to film it, is I'm going to go ahead and put on these new pulleys and we're going to give it a shot uh, live. So you'll be able to see if we're successful or not. Yeah, Mr. Patrick Smarty Pants was convinced he could do this in real time without any editing, so let's take a shot. I said, let's see if he's got all the right wrenches, tools, screwdriver, berries, whatever he needs all in front of him, or whether he has to stop and run and go find something. Okay. 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 <laughs> it was a good test, huh? Yeah. Okay, one of the things is we can't, we can't use this shaft which is unfortunate because, you know, I went with a larger diameter seeing if it would resolve this chatter problem, but now the problem is, you know, it's we'd have to press these on, but I don't think uh, we even have, this would be a really hard press, so we don't want to do that. Uh, we'll probably, I'll probably order, you know, a shaft, a different shaft, because I really want a new shaft. This is a little beat up. It'll be adequate for our testing right now, but um, but this is definitely too large in diameter. So, <laughs> okay, this doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, put our collars on. Yeah, but we're really anxious to put this little micro drill press in use, aren't we, Lance? Yeah, we just get past that little collar thing, we'll be all right. Oh, you want to explain to them that, you know, this is new to us? Oh, that's right, yeah, this isn't us rebuilding one of our, like, the 11s, those are ours that have been using them for two decades, that, that's not, that's not this, this. This is something we acquired, and we've had it forever, but we, you know, we're going to fix it, going to do it, you know, we say that all the time, we're going to get around and never do. Okay. <laughs> So because we stopped to fix all these, or, or refurbish all the other equipment, or rebuild it in some cases completely, we decided to go ahead and turn this little beauty into a workable piece of machinery, because we already have a micro drill press from Levin. The difference is, apparently, as Patrick was explaining on this newer one, that he justified the purpose for purchasing it, 
<laughs> thus putting us a little bit deeper into the poorhouse, was this one you you have you are able to uh, make the make the spindle go up and down where the other one on the eleven we have to make the table go up right right and which I'm used to right we're used to now but I've always wanted a little micro drill press with the, where the spindle goes up and down see like this which isn't doesn't mean it's any better actually the eleven's probably a little bit better because it does have a really uh, high precision spindle that's stationary so there's no movement see the problem with this is you've got a spindle that rotates between two bronze uh, bearings yep and and obviously it can't be too tight because then the spindle will turn so there's, there's going to be you know it's always going to be a little loose so you're going to have a little i mean we're talking about high high precision um applications but this i mean for most jobs this should be sufficient and i've always wanted one it, it is going to be a little easier to use for an eight hour day though i'm going to be real yeah. happy with it okay so far this looks good uh they're really smooth okay so let's put this on okay first let me put this just a little loose I really need to turn a little handle for this. People are wondering why I'm using. <laughs> okay, that's good for now. I just need to. Okay, get this on. Oops. Let's see if I need your help. Okay, yeah, I okay. can. I remember now. And my hand in there to hold the bottom of that pulley? The idler, idler pulley? Yeah, let me see. Um, yeah, that's what it is. Can you remember hold I this? come in and then you stress it? Yeah. Yeah, here, want to hold from here? Yep. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Okay, I got it now. Thank you. Okay. Want to be sure I got good. It's that belt comes up nice and square, doesn't it? Right from the motor, right up over those pulleys. That's nice. Looks nice. Actually, that's what I'm going to do. Clock's ticking. <laughs> okay, make sure I got the tension. Let me just confirm the tension. Okay, that's just, that feels really good. Yeah, that feels good. Okay, I think we're ready to give it a try. All right. Uh, Want to come out front? Or oh, yeah, I can where were you better? Let me get over here, so you know. Okay, let me turn it on. Let me see. Let's go forty percent. Ready? Yeah. Oh, well, night and day. Oh wow, that's nice. Isn't that nice? It's actually really quiet. If you have to listen to that all day long, it's really pleasant. Oh, it was really making loud, like almost like a horrible belt on a alternator in your car screech, oh. you know. Remember yeah. it? <laughs> oh, it was bad. Well, they'll see the little clip. I'm oh, that's sure. right. Yeah, but it was really bad. Oh, yeah, that's a lot better. Oh, look at the excitement in his eyes. Mm -hmm. like a little boy. Ha, <laughs> ha. Oh, yeah, I'm getting anxious to use it. Great. Well, that's one problem down. Two more go. Great. Well, that was nice to share. Okay. Well, thanks, Patrick. Oh, thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, Lance has a progress update he wants to share with us. Yep, yeah. 11 accessories. Let's go over those. It's like I'm living 11. 
<laughs> okay. This is a uh, heavy duty cross slide, as you know, we showed you before. And next to it is a double tool uh, cross slide. So, yeah, you shared. I shared uh, the first, or I shared the first two. Oh, it was right. you, and you held one in your hand. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Since then, and this one's waiting for a uh, rack, uh, a gear rack, I believe. Right, and that's why we haven't put the uh, the Pretty levers on. on right. This is how it will look. Next to it is is how it will look when it's done. This one I've also done now, though, since we last updated you. That's right. And I've done a whole bunch of these uh, tool rests, which are really important to us. And look at how pretty they are. I just want to give you these updates because I'm going to be taking you out in the shop in a minute. And I'm going to give you an update about the German micro... I'm sorry, the German tapping machine. And these are some of the parts for that. But I'm going to give you some uh, machining details about a part for that. And, um, and I think that's what I have, right? I think that covers... Nope. Oh, can I just turn the camera around just for a minute because 2019's coming. You, you know, I just want to reiterate on this Barker over here. Coming in 2019. The Barker Mill with its secret attachment. Okay. And we do have uh, uh -huh. tooling for it already. Oh yeah, well, I can't wait to... <laughs> I can't wait to make our first cut with it. It's been sitting here. Alright, I just wanted to keep the updates on all this stuff right here. I'm going to go ahead and take you out in the shop now and give you some final closure updates and we'll be done with it. Okay, great. Let's go. Okay, we're back in the machine shop and Lance has an update for us. Oh, welcome to prison. I'm just <laughs> funning. Now, right now, what's in front of me is, wow, really? Not 11 accessory. Nope, there's a couple little pieces, but for the most part, not for once. I actually get to look at some other made, American-made manufacturer named Marshall, but let me get back to that. I want to give you updates on the 11 accessory. You saw some. I just came from the workshop where people wear fancy white coats. <laughs> um, and... I showed you some accessories and stuff. There were three done or so, and there's a parts order for some of those. And I, I'm, I'm, I still have to finish a turret, the six position turret uh, accessory. I still have to finish the radius accessory, and I still have to finish the micro drill accessory for the Levens, and get them back into service. So to do that, I got to uh, dis I still disassembling them right now before they can even come to be clean, inspected, and polished, and all the stuff that goes with that before I get them back to pack. You know, that's got something coming to mind here. Hmm. You know, that's kind of strange. Uh, I know I've delivered everything, except for these last three. That means there's a couple missing. I better ask Pat Patrick, what happened to that beautiful, uh, the, 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 the two level and the three level regular, the, the, the regular duty cross slides from Levin that I know I put all that work in. These things are like sandwiches. You know, you have a sandwich with just a cheap sandwich with a piece of bologna in the middle. <laughs> these things are like a maximum Subway sandwich with the extra meat. There's so many parts and pieces and so many layers, it's really neat. So what happened to those? Yeah, what'd you do with them? Mm -hmm. Somebody <laughs> probably needs to get the no, lead out. They're in my hands. Actually, I still have to assemble them and adjust them, and then we can share them next week. Okay. <laughs> hey, how about some nice topic updates? I'm not, I know we usually do them in the openings. I'm going to put a few in right now because it's quite a bit to cover for next week. So I want to give you some updates on what what, what, what is going on. Uh, we have that 0.5 or half a millimeter thread pitch uh, we still have to do on those um, those uh, the bearing, bearing nuts for yeah. the for the micro uh, tapping machine right that's right the, ta the German tapping machine there it is I got my head on this right now when he came out here okay well okay you know those required a special tool bit we shared we had to order we did it came in so Patrick's gonna be machining this next video he's gonna be machining because we have to put that that 0.5 or half millimeter uh, pitch thread into that 14 millimeter diameter of that little thin little nut and we have to do a pair of those so Patrick can continue on the assembly to get that tapping machine back in business is that right that's right and we should hopefully if everything goes smoothly we can get the tapping machine uh, running again next week yeah and then now and then and then I'm also gonna wrap that up in there on those two 11 chip beds and the two 11 lathe beds both will be mounted securely and so will their motor mount uh, uh, to the back of those, be mounted through those wood tables and finalized from me. That means Patrick just builds them up from there. And of course, we got that special spindle rebuilding going on, that high tolerance. That's going to be exciting. Yeah. Uh, that's a pullout video, by the way. You're going to love it. The other thing is, I guess I'm down to just the fun part. Somebody might want to ask this, so I better answer it before it, hits, it gets asked. We've talked about why the, we wear these funny coats. But, 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 you know, there's a reason why the one is blue in the machine shop 
and the ones white in the workshop, I always say it's because they don't get no work done in there. <laughs> but okay. Uh, here's what happened. Patrick broke the rule, and instead of switching coats for coming outside, I mean, at least he put his shoes on to come out here. You don't wear shoes in the workshop. You wear shoes in the machine shop. You have to switch every time, just so you know. And you're supposed to switch jackets. Well, he was in a hurry, and he was coming to the lathe, and he was going to do some cutting. It was the lathe or the mill? I don't remember. He was going to do some kind of cutting. Maybe it's when he left all those chips in the bottom of the machine over there and didn't finish. <laughs> oh, no, that was me. Okay. So it splattered oil all over. And it went all over that pretty little white coat from the little workshop. And he had to send it off to the dry cleaners. I learned my lesson. <laughs> I said, but here's the deal. If, you, if oil ever shoots across the room in the, in the uh, workshop area, all that is is a little, uh, it's a little micro bit, a micro bite of nano oil that's all it is one little you you wouldn't even see it if it landed on your coat it's so micro mini <laughs> anyway i just wanted to top it off with that and thank you all for everything oh, well, quick, oh uh, yeah what did i forget what are you working on right now oh, okay i do love to talk about our little babies this is a marshall mill mill milling head uh attachment and i'm telling you you won't be f seeing another one. Um, probably not. They didn't sell well, apparently, Patrick, right? You said they didn't really sell well. Yeah, you just don't see them. You know, you know we see the Levins, we see other uh, manufactured uh, milling attachments, but not the Marshall. You do see Marshall cross slides yeah, every okay. once in a while, you know, for sale. But uh, yeah, I think just one other time in what, a 25, 30 year experience, I've, I've only seen one other Marshall milling attached. So we're really thankful to have this little puppy, and we're really thankful that we have the knowledge to put it back together, and we hope it's going to do great years of service, and we hope we get to share that on film with you. It's going to be really neat. We just love to... Well, look, we have to machine parts and make a living, so we just love to share it, though, and have somebody besides the two of us to talk about it with. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe. And if you leave us one of those comments, maybe we have something we can answer. We will never leave a question unanswered. Thank you.